Thank you for being here, Mrs. Ezekwesili, um, your former Minister of Education for Nigeria, but so much more also, co-founder of Transparency International and founder of the initiative Bring Back Our Girls. Um, we are going to talk about demographics in Africa today, and I would have liked to, to ask you, what is the main challenge now in Nigeria, your country, considering that its population is already one of the highest, uh, most populous in, the, in Africa? And what do you think the right policies should be? Uh, well, Nigeria is already the largest uh, uh, country uh, population-wise on the continent. And, uh, you know, it's uh, estimated to be 200 million people. Um, the age structure shows that uh, more than 60% are youths um, and children. Um, it shows a balance between men and women at almost uh, 51 to 49%. Um, the, youth, the youthful population has very serious pressures uh, because you do need investment in uh, education especially, as well as in health. Um, every population of a country is just human beings until there is uh, a translation of just being a human being to being human capital. That's when that uh, population becomes very, very useful, not just to itself, but to the rest of the world. And so um, making sure that today's data, which shows that Nigeria has the largest number of out-of-school children, doesn't stay haunting us uh, by just continuing to grow as the size of the population grows, making sure that maternal and infant mortality uh, does not continue to go beyond, be above the continental average, uh, making sure that the number of young people who come out of uh, the school system or fall out of it or graduate from it and cannot find any meaningful job, any decent job according to ILO standard. Um, but, and, and today, about two to three million of such young people every year, making sure that all of these things are reversed because they are negative. Um, that's really at the heart of policy. So that the demographic can either be designed in a way through policy to be demographic opportunity and advantage, or it could be demographic disaster. And, and, and the, the gap between one and the other is the presence or absence of sound policies and appropriate investment. And for me, uh, the, and also actually the regulatory systems that work. So for me, I think that um, at the heart of this conversation is making sure that the country experiences high growth, high economic growth, but not just growth. Um, inclusive growth, growth that is diversified, uh, because you need for economic opportunities to expand so that people can have the basic services. For example, I want to be able to see as many children as possible go through the school system and assure basic education for every child, universal access, mm -hmm. and then make sure that they have not just access to education, but quality education, and at the secondary level, that they can have not just knowledge, but skills, mm -hmm. so that what you're doing, in, if, in effect, is you're already producing a, a, a large population of people who can take their destiny into their own hands, okay. and and that and that is really something that requires very strong 
very effective political leadership. Yes, you said during the conference that uh, there was a lack of audacity, uh, political audacity. Mabigin Gom, you are the regional director for the UNFPA in Dakar, covering West and Central Africa, 23 countries. Um, what um, is the most worrying side of the demographics in Africa today for you, on your point of view? What is the most worrying well, side? I think uh, the, uh, the minister touched uh, the, real, uh, the real issue. I think it's really about um, uh, having the right policies in place. Uh, but I want to come back to, uh, to Nigeria. Uh, because Nigeria accounts for about 2% of the world population. At the same time, Nigeria accounts 10% in terms of maternal mortality. I think this shows a fundamental uh, issue uh, that needs to, need to be addressed. Second, I think the minister also said rightly, um, how can we make sure that we uh, invest enough in the education sector mm -hmm. so that we can keep every child in the school. And it's even going to be an even stronger requirement as we enter uh, the fourth industrial revolution, where there will be a drastic change in terms of uh, the type of job that we need to perform, the kind of education that we need to give to our children, but also, um, you know, the big issue is uh, where we're going to find the fiscal space uh, to deal with this huge court of young people, mm -hmm. uh, given the current concerns we are facing. That's one bucket. The other bucket, just want to move it from uh, Nigeria uh, to uh, one or two countries like Niger and, uh, and Mali, just to make a case about the uh, lack of fiscal space. In Mali or in Niger, for instance, they're spending 18% of their uh, uh, public expenditure on the security response because of the current yes. you know, situation. Uh, in Niger, it's 18%. In Mali, it's 24% already. Mm -hmm. And I believe that after this week's event in Niger, they will have to do more in terms of dealing with security issues. If you connect the dots, <clears throat> these countries will not be able to meet, for instance, the Abuja target of investing 15% of their resources in health. In Mali, currently, they are below 5%. Rather than in increasing public expenditure in health, it's decreasing at a time when the population have doubled. To come back to your original question, I think there is one thing that can change everything, is really dealing with high population growth that lead to a high social demand, individuals, families, communities, countries themselves and their partners are unable to respond to, mm -hmm. making fragile states even more fragile. Mm -hmm. So we are not talking about a, you know, a chance to, uh, uh, to, you know, to hit uh, the target we have established for the 2030 mm -hmm. agenda. But even when it comes to the Africa we want, especially in the uh, aspiration six, where they really want to focus on the human being, putting women and young people first, and caring for children. Mm -hmm. I think this is a time where we need to have the right policies the minister have rightly uh, okay. uh, spoken about. There is a, there is a contradic contradictory perception around the African population growth and nowadays, some perceive it as a hope, a motive for hope, and some perceive it as a threat. Uh, the migration issue is uh, entering the discussion, and people worry that the jobless youth in Africa will really now migrate massively to Europe and elsewhere. Do you think it's a real reason of, of uh, of worry that, that well, I've said it to Europeans mm -hmm. that they should stop making the issue of um, migration the topic of engagement with Africa. Mm -hmm. I think that this is. Um, I mean, think of even the even the uh, data doesn't doesn't prove this necessity for mm -hmm. Europe to get mm -hmm. so so angsty about Africa mm -hmm. and Africans. 
You know, the, the, the migration into Europe has mostly happened from within the, 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 the Europe itself. The Eastern Europeans have largely migrated to, 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 to the European, mm -hmm. uh, the Central European nations, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, you, you look at uh, the migration that has come from the Middle East. Uh, Africans are not the most <laughs> people. I saw a recent data that was uh, uh, that was mm -hmm. released by the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, right. and I, 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 I it, mm -hmm. it, it just disproves any Absolutely. of these any of these prioritization of uh, you know Africans and migration mm -hmm. to Europe. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Now, you know, if Europe wants to have a relationship with Africa, it has to define that relationship where uh, partnership and economic cooperation and collaboration will yield. Um, a, a better outcome for both mm -hmm. continents, mm -hmm. right? And um, even in terms of the demographics, I, I think that, as I said, if we got the political courage and the kind of um, uh, intelligent governments that we require in order to have the right sets of policies mm -hmm. that translate mm -hmm. our human resources into human capital, mm -hmm. uh, we would be in a position where actually Europe would have to be sad that it ever thought of Africa uh, in terms of migration in a negative way. Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. this, this could be uh, the opportunity that Europe has as its own demographic structure yes. you know, changes and it's, yes. uh, and, and, um, and it's an mm -hmm. aging population that's going to bust its uh, yes. pension and it needs to maintain a certain level of productivity. And at some level we could say that the lack of vision that you often criticize in African governance is also there in European politics. Mm -hmm. With Africa there's a, a sheer lack of vision, Indeed. isn't it? I do say to, uh, you know, uh, because I've spent, I've been spending a couple of uh, months now in Europe, uh, specifically in Berlin, um, where I'm at the Robert Bosch Academy uh, doing, uh, being a Richard von Weizsäcker fellow. And, and the key thing, the key message that I've been giving to them is that, you know, Africa is not a charity case. Africa is a business case. Mm -hmm. And somehow Europe hasn't come to a, a shift of its of its mind. Mm -hmm. they, they, this mindset of Africa as, as, a, as a backyard and as, as, as a charity case, it's going to haunt Europe. Yes. You know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the years ahead. Because, by the way, Africa is the, is the, is the last frontier of development, right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. And ultimately, um, in all this bumbling leadership that we see around, we are at the cusp where people are waking up to the requirement of effective leadership, mm -hmm. and they are going to demand it. And when this tide changes, what it means is that you would see from out of Africa the right economic policies, the right institutions being developed, the right investment being done. And at that point in time, if your mindset is still toward a, an Africa that you you do charity for, you would be missing from the table. Absolutely. And and another second, a second thing that I I say to the Europeans a lot is, you know, stop having to ask me about China every time you see me. Why don't you ignore whatever China is up to and design your own reference for engaging with the continent? Because as an African and as a as as, as a policy leader on my continent, I'm not I'm not defining my relationship with Europe or China on the basis of what they want. I'm going to define it on the basis of our own interest. Your agenda. Precisely. Mm -hmm. So our interest has no, you know, our friendship happens when there is a meeting of interest. Of the agendas. Right? Yeah. Of the agendas. Mm -hmm. so, so this idea that, that it is either Europe or China for for, for Africa, mm -hmm. that's absolute don't, nonsense. Don't, don't you think that uh, demographics, African demographics, have a potential of political revolution? But I, I won't ask this to you because maybe... But, no, no. but the, the mere fact that um, Africa is in its demographic transition later than all the other continents mm -hmm. because it has known mm -hmm. slavery mm -hmm. and colonization, is, is, is just a normalization of its demographic because the continent is actually empty and we tend to forget that. People think it's overpopulated, but no, it's, it's an empty continent. 
do you think that the, the sheer demo, African demographic will shift the perspectives on the continent one, one day? No, let me, let me push back a little bit about the uh, idea that Africa is an empty continent. And I think if, uh, I don't think that it's about the, uh, the size of the population, but I think it should be about the ability of Africa and African countries to keep their people, to give them good education, give them good health, give them jobs so that they don't cross the Atlantic or they don't get, you know, uh, well, to the kind I, of situation. I think they should be able to cross. Yeah. The only thing is to not look at the crossing mm -hmm. as a burden, mm -hmm. you know, because the movement of people, mm -hmm. of capital, mm -hmm. of, of services, mm -hmm. this is all part of our global world. Mm -hmm. You can't, on the one hand, like globalization mm -hmm. at a particular time mm -hmm. and not like it at a different mm -hmm. time. And by mm -hmm. the way, mm -hmm. why should Europeans who had, is, you know, who, who found it very easy to migrate into Africa now mm -hmm. have a problem with Africans, you know, coming in that direction? Mm -hmm. I think that movement should happen. Mm -hmm. The only thing is that for African leaders, mm -hmm. they should, you know, it should worry us that any of our citizens would consider whatever is at home too difficult mm -hmm. to face than the prospects that they could die mm -hmm. trying to cross into another continent. Mm -hmm. That should be mm -hmm. a source of pain for us. No, but I think it's, um, I think it's a little more, comp when I mean cross, it means uh, what we have seen uh, last week, uh, these young people about 65 dying, the condition of crossing, the chance of succeeding, and the chance of, uh, I would say, a positive outcome at the end of the day. Putting and I think we can create. I think uh, the first thing is, uh, if we educate our people, if they have good health, if they have opportunities, mm -hmm. then I think it will no longer be a kind of a forced migration like what we have seen, where people, I know young people who say, we're going to get, we're going to cross or we're going to die. I think that is the state, the, the situation, case. I think that we need to change as Africans. That's one. But I see hope uh, because there is some, uh, there are some strong signs that uh, Africans are adjusting their mindset much faster uh, than, than Europe. But coming back to the idea, the vision Europe has, still have about Africa, part of it is also part of the growing populism. I'm not sure that uh, what is being said very often is what people think, similarly in the Africa side. I know, for instance, it will be difficult, most of the leaders in Africa, those who are sitting, to say exactly their idea about the population. Very often, when you sit with them, they convince. But they're politicians. As soon as you signal right, the opposition signal left. I think it's part of the game. The two or three things I want to put on the table are a sign of uh, change. First, we have a strong engagement of religious leaders. I have seen, for example, the, uh, the Sultan of uh, the Emir of Kano making a presentation on the demographic dividend, and President Buhari was sitting in the room. These are the kind of things we did not, that didn't happen in the past. Mm -hmm. In Burkina Faso, the Moro Naba, the Moro Naba uh, is very, very engaged. I met the religious leader last week in, the, in Cotonou, and they pledging for support from UNFPA and UNFPA partners so they can continue the croisade against high fertility rate. So this means since are moving, young people are on board, parliamentarians are on board, mm. everybody is on board. Now what we need to, ha to happen today is how can we build on the success stories yes. to scale up? And because as long as you have one or two bright spots, you will not have the critical mass you need to bring about impact. So the challenge today is really making sure that uh, the bright, the few bright spots are promoted, they are supported, mm -hmm. so we move to scale mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and change mm -hmm. the landscape mm -hmm. in Africa. But we are sitting mm -hmm. in Morocco, a country where the demographic transition has happened quicker than expected. Don't you think that the example of Morocco could widen up and, and, and spread in, in West Africa with a quicker transition than expected? No, I, think, uh, I think it's happening, because I was in Dakar about uh, four or five months ago. 
and uh, we brought religious leaders, including some from Morocco. And the deputy imam of Al Azhar issued a fatwa against child marriage. And we know that child marriage is a key driver of maternal mortality, a key driver of high population growth, and it's a terrible gender-based violence. So you see, that fatwa need to be uh, promoted, need to be communicated in places like Kenya, in Sudan, in Somalia, in Nigeria, in the North part, where the minister have flagged, you know, a few minutes ago, the importance of the youth population. I was in Kaduna, and the governor told me, young people represent 83% of the population. So how can you handle mm -hmm. such a youth population mm -hmm. And what does this mean in terms yes. of their education, their yes. health? Yes. So, That's the so, so really, I think that Morocco's example is also uh, when you look at how it, the king uh, you leveraged his influence to promote girls' education. Girls' education really responds uh, to a lot of the challenges we have mm -hmm. in terms of the, the issues of population growth. Um, when girls go to school, they delay marriage. When girls go to school, they are so empowered, they can make better decisions. Uh, when girls go to school, some of those decisions they make determine the legacy of generations to come, and therefore can determine how healthy a country's population will be, can determine how informed a country's population will be, and ultimately can determine the kind of speed, uh, you know, the speed with which a, co a population can achieve uh, development. So girls' education is so much at the center of everything mm -hmm. we discuss concerning mm -hmm. population bulge. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, to end on a positive note, mm -hmm. the more that we look at the successes um, I remember that one of the interventions we did in Niger was on this matter of dealing with high fertility levels through girls' education. Mm -hmm. And we began to see the impact. Um, you know, most of the girls that went through that program reduced number of children that they were going to have from the average of eight and they began to have like yeah. three children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so it is how we sustain the successes that we have seen mm -hmm. in terms of those kinds of intervention mm -hmm. and then use them uh, in, in ways that, uh, that, that are very deliberate and we can achieve speed and scale yes, while doing absolutely. so. No, I think you're, you're right. Uh, Niger is a good example. The uh, highest authority told me a few days ago uh, they have every year 600,000 new young Nigerians who are supposed to go to school. Unfortunately, mm. they are able only uh, to put in classroom 300,000. By the age of 13, half of them are leaving because of child marriage. Okay. So it means 75% of the population are not going to school. Now, with the security situation, I think the challenge is even greater. So the only way forward, from my limited perspective, will be uh, to build partnership, uh, to build a strong partnership, partnerships that go beyond uh, the lamentation we're hearing from around the world about you know, how to help Africa, uh, how to uh, create a rupture, mm -hmm. but I think through strong, genuine partnership, supporting girl education, I think we should be able, in the next decade, I'm not talking about 20 or 30 years, in 10 years, 15 years time, we're going to see drastic change in the development landscape okay. in Africa. Thank you very much, both of you. Very interesting uh, conversation. And uh, hopefully you will come back next year. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you.